This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. So today I'm switching it up and bringing you a story that took place on the forward operating base Ramrod in Kandahar, Afghanistan. There were members of the army from the rank of private first class to staff sergeant who committed atrocious murders against people who were innocent locals. You're listening to episode 32, The Maywand District Murders. The army's forward operating base was known as Ramrod, and was in Maywand, in the southern Kandahar province of Afghanistan. In 2008, it was a volatile area, where the Taliban seemed to have the upper hand. They launched many attacks with landmines, ambushes, suicide bombers, and improvised explosive device, or IED attacks. Army platoon emotions were running hot. They felt defeated from all the one-sided incidents they experienced while on patrol. There wasn't much engagement with the Taliban, other than to see the fighters, known as squirters, fleeing from explosions on motorcycles. The members of the 3rd Platoon Bravo Company felt hamstrung by this elusiveness, and they wanted to engage in combat. Staff Sergeant Calvin Gibbs joined Bravo Company at the Forward Operating Base, or FOB Ramrod, in November 2009. A well-liked NCO, or non-commissioned officer, Sergeant Robert Samuel volunteered for patrol, but was unlucky when he got caught in an IED attack. Even though he was medically evacuated from Ramrod, he lost his legs. This event added to the emotional intensity experienced by the members of the platoon. Gibbs felt guilty that he wasn't out on patrol. He was one of the more experienced officers within the platoon so they made him squad leader of the 5th Striker Brigade combat team in Bravo Company. Gibbs was from Billings, Montana, and grew up in a devout Mormon family. He dropped out of high school, passed the GED, and enlisted in the Army in 2002. Some of his early assignments brought him to Hawaii and New York. In 2004, he deployed to Iraq for a year. In January 2006, he deployed to Afghanistan and was there until May 2007. He went to Afghanistan the summer of 2009 and worked security detail for one of the top commanders since Gibbs was an imposing figure with a 6-foot, 4-inch, 220-pound frame. When he joined the men of Bravo Company, the first thing he did was hang a pirate flag on his tent, which set the tone for the men under his command. Prior to his arrival, the platoon only had one recorded kill of a Taliban insurgent fighter. The culture at Ramrod did not represent the standard discipline or integrity that one might expect from the Army. There was an obvious lack of discipline, with lax grooming standards and frequent drug use. Hashish was an easy drug to score. The U.S. men would often buy it from their Afghan interpreters. Gibbs wasn't a drug user himself, but he didn't mind if his men took part. While some of these things are reasonably harmless, this culture would eventually morph into something unrecognizable and inauspicious. The recent IED attack was on everyone's mind. Staff Sergeant Calvin Gibbs and Corporal Jeremy Morlock often talked about it. Not only did these Taliban insurgents irritate Gibbs, but he resented all Afghans. He felt that they were savages and didn't deserve to live. Gibbs often discussed killing unarmed Afghans with Morlock. He confided in Morlock that on a previous deployment, he unlawfully killed Iraqis sitting in a vehicle at a checkpoint. He told a lie to his commander, and they deemed the kill an appropriate engagement, which followed military law. Sometimes Gibbs and Morlock even spoke in jest about throwing candy outside their military vehicles for Afghani kids 
so they could shoot or run them over. This conversation turned into Gibbs and Morlock discussing how they could create a scenario where they could kill a local Afghan and create the appearance of a justified kill. Their talks became more intense and specific. They discussed using a drop weapon, which was a weapon that they would plant on a dead body and make it appear as if the Afghan was trying to attack the platoon. They also talked about detonating a grenade to make it appear as if the Afghan was going to throw the explosive at the platoon. Gibbs and Morlock would have to pick villages carefully, only selecting ones that were known for being pro-Taliban, and the villages had to have males that were of a military age. Gibbs and Morlock began pulling others into their plans. Staff Sergeant David Bram and Sergeant Darren Jones were the first to be brought into the fold. This extended to platoon members Corporal Emmett Kintel, Private First Class Andrew Holmes and Ashton Moore, and Specialists Adam Kelly, Corey Moore, Adam Winfield, and Michael Wagnon II. Gibbs was charismatic and really sold this plan. The platoon members could be part of a small kill team, kind of like being in black ops. A black operation is a secret operation usually carried out by a government agency, a military unit, or a paramilitary organization. The key ingredient is that the mission and the agency that carried out the actions are not able to be linked. This plan was motivational for some of the younger soldiers who lacked combat experience. This was a path to attaining combat infantry badges and awards. They could also return home with combat tales that they could tell their friends and family. Gibbs started buying off-the-book supplies. He contacted another NCO from another unit on the base and was able to get a crate of grenades. Every platoon was supposed to keep accountability records for explosives. If Gibbs was running a legitimate operation, he would have added them to the accountability log. But Gibbs wasn't an above-the-board type of soldier, and this was how he was able to circumvent his own platoon's resupply system. In December 2009, Gibbs handed one of those off-the-books grenades to Morlock, who was ready to run the first scenario. On January 15, 2010, Morlock and Holmes were in the village of La Muhammad Calais, out on patrol. The men were sent there because there was a report that insurgents were hiding in tunnels in that village. The patrol was quickly hit with the reality that there was no one from the Taliban in that village. The village was composed of poor Afghan farmers who had no electricity or running water in their homes made of mud and straw and their clothes were traditional, albeit tattered. Morlock and Holmes noticed that there was one young farmer working in the poppy fields in his cap and green jacket. The boy's name was Galmudin, and he was 15 years old and was working alone. An interpreter was instructed to call him over. Gal stood about 20 feet away and was on the other side of a wall that was only a few feet high. The U.S. men dismissed the interpreter. They shouted at Gull and Pashto and demanded that he stand still. The boy complied with the orders and never at any time showed ill intent. Morlock activated the off-the-books grenade as he tossed it over the wall. Holmes then fired his automatic weapon at the young Afghani farmer. Gibbs and Bram heard the explosion and ran towards the noise. There was white powder where the grenade detonated. Bram kicked the dirt around and the white powder disappeared into the ground. That white powder was a dead giveaway that it was a United States grenade. When the team searched the dead Afghani, there were no weapons or ammunition. His fingerprints and eyes were scanned with a biometric device. His clothes were stripped off, and they checked the boy for identifiers like tattoos or body marks. Morlock and Holmes posed for photos with the corpse, as if they were in the middle of deer season as opposed to an overseas deployment. Gibbs cut off one finger from the deceased boy and gifted the trophy to Holmes, since he fired the kill shot. Later on, Morlock issued an apology to Gibbs for initiating the setup without him. Gibbs told him that he executed the situation exactly as they had discussed. 
Mere hours after the patrol, Morlock Holmes and other members of Bravo Company were back on the base, playing spades. Holmes and Morlock were bantering on about using the trophy as betting collateral for their card game, and then the finger was tossed onto the card table. Some men closed out their night, sitting in the protection of the striker, which shielded everyone from the watchful eye of their commanders as they smoked hashish bought off the translators. They relived and regaled the scenario they completed that day. For those unfamiliar, a striker is an eight-wheeled armored combat vehicle. When the United States started using these heavily armored combat machines, the insurgents started creating more powerful IEDs. Galmudin's relatives were not going to accept what happened to their beloved family member. Gull's uncle paid a visit to the Ramrod base with 20 villagers in tow. He explained to the base commanders that children in the village had witnessed the soldiers murder the 15-year-old farmer. Based on this information, the senior leadership at Ramrod decided to re-interview everyone involved in the incident. The interviews between the soldiers were consistent, therefore the complaint was dropped. But the issue was never explored in any detail even though Gibbs' men openly shared photos taken with the deceased and freely talked about the killing and the finger trophy. Gibbs took steps to obtain more drop weapons, and just as fate would have it, an Afghan National Police vehicle was damaged in an IED attack right outside of the FOB Ramrod base. From the site of the accident, Gibbs obtained a black AK-47 that had a folding AR-style buttstock, along with matching magazines. The weapon was stashed in Bram's striker vehicle. Gibbs and Morlock were considering using this new drop weapon like they did with a grenade, but they left it to Bram to construct the next plan. It was January 27, 2010, and Gibbs' team was out on a patrol, driving a highway that wasn't far from the base. Their thermal imaging technology detected a person who was balled up on the side of the road. They stopped when they were a hundred yards out and dismounted from the vehicle. As the man stood up, the U.S. soldiers could not determine if he was cold or if he was trying to obscure a suicide vest because of the way he carried his arms in front of his chest. They aimed powerful spotlights at the stranger and demanded he lift his shirt. Instead of complying, he paced back and forth, so the soldiers fired warning shots at him. The man continued to ignore the soldiers' warnings and everyone fired their weapons. Gibbs and five other soldiers unloaded 40 rounds. Gibbs and his men walked over to the dead body, only to discover that this man was unarmed, and he was not wearing any explosives. Their high-power military weapons inflicted substantial damage, and pieces of the Afghan's cranial bones were missing. Wagnon bent down, gathered a piece of skull fragment, and pocketed the trophy the team searched the area for weapons for the better part of an hour, but they were not able to find anything. Some men worried about the blowback of having another incident, especially with an unarmed Afghan. Ram ordered Kintal to go to the striker and fetch one of the drop ammunition magazines that had been stashed in the storage compartment. Ram called out to everyone that he found something. And just like that, Staff Sergeant David Bram fabricated a situation where the incident was now legitimate, since the dead Afghan on the side of the road had a weapon. The U.S. military stance on this incident was that the Afghan was responsible for his own death, with or without the weapon, since he ignored commands he received. It would later surface that the man was mentally disabled, and possibly even deaf. Not long after the incident, 75 Afghan elders called a meeting with the U.S. Army officials at the FOB Ramrod base. They were upset because Army soldiers were acting like barbarians when they patrolled their southern Afghanistan villages. The Americans were shooting dogs and livestock and were egregiously breaking cultural norms by searching Afghan homes when only women and children were present. The two Afghan men that were killed by the U.S. Army patrol could not be characterized as insurgents and were not aligned with the Taliban. The Taliban terrorized one victim because his family supported NATO, and the other victim was intellectually disabled. 
The Afghan message to the U.S. Army commanders was that the U.S. Army's patrolmen were lying to them, and it needed to be investigated. When secrets of notable gravity are shared by more than a few people, it doesn't take long for details to spread. And an allegiance will dissolve when the limits of morality are stretched. The first allegiance that soured was between Calvin Gibbs and Adam Winfield. In February 2010, Winfield was the striker commander for Gibbs, and he left the eight-wheeled armored vehicle unsecured. To punish Winfield, Gibbs put him through a series of physical exercises. This did not go over well with Winfield, and he told Gibbs that he was done driving the striker. This concerned Gibbs, and he told Morlock that he was afraid that Winfield might tell someone about the two Afghan murders. Morlock and Gibbs plotted a scenario in which they would drop a weight on Winfield's neck at the gym, or take him to the motor pool where all the vehicles are worked on, and drop one of those heavy tow bars on him. Gibbs warned Winfield that he better keep his mouth shut. Did he want to go home in a body bag? Winfield accurately took this as a threat. On February 14, 2010, Winfield jumped on Facebook Messenger to chat with his father. He told his dad how he was being punished for not locking the striker, and that he quit that job, which wasn't fair since some soldiers on the squad were literally getting away with murder. He typed, I cannot work for my squad leader, who punishes me for leaving a striker unlocked, and gives high fives to a guy who kills innocent people, and plans more with him. He told his dad that the entire platoon knew about the 15-year-old Afghan farmer and the -the off-the-books grenade that was planted. Winfield wasn't sure who he could trust within the platoon, and the threats he received were concerning. He wanted to maybe find a chaplain on base he could confide in. Winfield told his dad that if he could speak to anyone of authority, he had the proof that they were planning another murder because Gibbs obtained a drop AK-47. The elder Winfield was concerned about the safety of his son. The young soldier told him not to worry and that he had convinced some of the team of his loyalty. But that did not ease the elder Winfield's fear about the peril his son was facing. The elder Winfield reached out to a senator, the Army Inspector General's office, and the Army's Criminal Investigation Command, and not much came from those efforts. He called the Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington, which was the home base of the 5th Striker Brigade combat teams. He spoke with an officer there who informed him that the only way the Army could take action was if his son reported the incidents through his commanders at Ramrod. Eventually, Adam Winfield asked his father to stop calling officials because he was worried if it got back to the platoon, he would be in danger. Plus, he felt his relationship had improved with Gibbs, and it appeared that Gibbs was starting to bring him into his trusted group of men. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt True Crime. If you are a true crime podcast listener, you must have heard about Best Fiends. It's an entertaining puzzle game that everyone is playing. It's a chill game that you can play on your phone. I've even played it on my iPad before. Best Fiends keeps adding new levels and events every single month, so they keep it entertaining. It's a great game to play when I need to take a break from editing and scoring my true crime podcast. And you don't even need to be tethered to Wi-Fi because you can play without an internet connection. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hi, everyone. I really need to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their licensed professional therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in just about anything, including anxiety, depression, family conflicts, trauma, and LGBTQ issues. I work from home and barely leave my house. 
so it's great that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your own home. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional in-person counseling, and financial aid is available. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states, and you can start talking with your counselor in less than 24 hours. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Now, back to the show. On February 22nd, 2010, Gibbs and his men were heading out on another patrol, this time to the Kari KL village, which had a reputation for being a source of Taliban activity. This provided a perfect cover for the brigade to run one of their scenarios. Prior to their departure, Gibbs and Morlock discussed isolating an Afghan from the village and utilizing the drop AK-47, which Gibbs had stuffed in his assault pack. The weapon was sizable and wouldn't fit in the pack, so he removed the flash suppressor and muscled the bag shut. After they entered the village, Gibbs found an Afghan man and led him to the area near Morlock. Wagnon and Morlock had just finished their rounds, and Gibbs joined them outside the entryway of the compound. Gibbs asked them if they wanted to smoke this guy. They all agreed. Gibbs walked into the compound while Morlock and Wagnon hung back. Morlock witnessed Gibbs fire rounds into the entryway wall to make it appear as if the Afghan had fired a round at the platoon. Gibbs then shot the Afghan with a standard M4 rifle, issued to him by the U.S. Army, and he dropped the AK-47 next to the deceased Afghan. Morlock and Wagnon went through the entryway and fired their weapons towards the Afghan to play along with the ruse. Staff Sergeant Chris Sprague showed up after hearing the gunfire. Gibbs started reciting his version of what happened. He was fired on by the Afghan, but when the Afghan's weapon jammed, Gibbs returned fire. Sprague was a gun guy and had extensive knowledge about military weapons. He rattled off a few facts about this firearm. It was a Hungarian AMD-65, which had fallen out of favor for the Hungarian military but was commonly used by the Afghan National Police. Sprague enthusiastically picked up the weapon and carried it around as he finished clearing the compound. There were a few things that made little sense. There was not a round chambered in the AK, and the safe and later setting was on. The handguard sling and flash suppressor were missing from the gun. There were no other weapons or ammunition found in the area of the incident. Sprague had never fired an AMD-65, so he asked if it was okay to go full auto. Gibbs did his best to dissuade him, stating that the ammunition might be dangerous or defective. Sprague did not squander this precious opportunity and fired off a burst of bullets. The gun functioned perfectly. The platoon examined the body for any identifying marks. Gibbs took a pair of medical shears and cut off one of the deceased Afghan's fingers. The body was placed in a bag. The relatives of this man, whose name was Marak Ega, spoke out about his death because he was an extremely religious man and he would never have picked up a weapon for any reason. Gibbs was seeking more drop weapons and obtained several things, including a rocket-propelled grenade round, a broken claymore mine held together with duct tape, 20 to 30 feet of detonation cord, a C4 plastic explosive, an old Russian pineapple-style grenade, and an 81-millimeter U.S. mortar round. This time, Morlock and Gibbs were discussing a more elaborate scenario where they would use some explosives to create an IED. One of the senior medics in the platoon went on leave, so Gibbs reached out to his friend, Staff Sergeant Robert Stevens, who was also a medic. Gibbs wanted him to come to FOB Ramrod and go out on patrol with the platoon. 
Gibbs told Stevens that they would find someone to kill while on patrol. Stevens agreed to fill in and spend two to three weeks with Gibbs and his men. But he would later say that he didn't think Gibbs literally meant that they would kill someone. He assumed Gibbs meant that they would patrol for Taliban insurgents. On March 10, 2010, Stevens, Jones, Wagnon, and Gibbs went out on foot patrol. Two Afghan men were working out in the field. The farmers were not armed, and one, in fact, was using a shovel. Gibbs stationed his men in a ditch. He asked Stevens to unzip his pack and find the Claymore mine. Gibbs wanted to draw those farmers inward and detonate the explosive. Stevens immediately disapproved of this plan, as he was worried that the Claymore mine might kill the U.S. men. Gibbs shifted gears and yelled out that one of the Afghans had a rocket-propelled grenade. He counted the team down and had them fire upon the two Afghanis. When the two farmers heard the shots, they ran. While the team was searching the area, Gibbs was explaining the plan to Stevens. If both Afghans were dead, they would say that there was a third Afghan who ran off with the RPG. The team found one man out in the farm field. There was a shovel on the ground beside his feet, but he wasn't one of the two Afghans that ran for the hills when they heard the gunfire. After they searched him and found nothing, they released him. There was no trace of the two farmers, not even a trail of blood. Prior to May 2010, the platoon was on patrol in Kayla Day Village, which was close to the army base, and they detained an Afghan male when they found an IED in his house. They released him, but went back to the village on May 2, 2010, to re-interview him. Gibbs and Morlock decided that this would be a good time to use the Russian pineapple grenade. Before they left for the patrol, Morlock explained the details of the scenario with both Bram and Winfield. Winfield had gone from being outside the inner circle and worrying about his safety several months prior to taking part in the setups. Bram was the opposite. He took part in the setups from the beginning, and now he decided he was done with it. Morlock and Winfield entered the compound, and they were met by an older Afghan male, a female, and a few children. Gibbs walked the male outside of the compound walls. He tossed a grenade at the man and blew his legs apart. Then Morlock and Winfield shot at the Afghan. Gibbs walked over and put two bullets in the man's head, while Morlock planted the Russian pineapple grenade. Morlock recited the story. The Afghan came at them with grenades, but dropped them and blew his own legs off when he and Winfield fired off rounds in defense. The Afghan's wife and two young children had to be pushed away from his body. When the platoon searched the rest of the compound, they didn't find any ammunition, weapons, or males that were of military age. Before they left the village, Gibbs took fingers and a tooth from the corpse and gifted the tooth to Winfield, telling him that he was a made man. A base commander heard how upset the villagers were over this kill, and he sent one of the Army's lieutenants to listen to the complaints. An investigation was never initiated, even though the man they killed, 45-year-old Mullah Allah Dad, was a cleric. Out of all the things that could have unraveled this platoon, it was a disagreement about drug use that marked the beginning of the end. Ironically, Private First Class Justin Stoner did not do drugs. A bunch of guys from the platoon consistently smoked hash in his housing unit, and Stoner was scared that he would be accused of doing drugs. On May 3rd, Stoner reported the hash smoking to a staff NCO who was on duty. Stoner also told him that the Afghan that had been killed back in January was unarmed. The on-duty officer decided not to take any actions about the unarmed Afghan and figured Stoner was upset and needed to vent. The officer was going to address the drug use, though. He promised Stoner that he would remain anonymous in the formal complaint. It took little effort for Gibbs and the squad to figure out it was Private First Class Justin Stoner who had reported the drug use. There was too much at stake so Gibbs and Morlock decided that Stoner needed to be put in his place. 
On May 5th, 2010, Jeremy Morlock, David Bram, Darren Jones, Corey Moore, Emmett Kintel, and Adam Kelly went to deliver an important message to Justin Stoner. Stoner promised everyone that he never reported the drug use, but he cracked under the pressure of all the threats. The men gave him a group beating, but only hit him below the neck as to not leave evidence on his face. Later on, Morlock returned with Calvin Gibbs and Private First Class Michael LaCroix because they wanted to ensure that Stoner received the proper message. Gibbs flashed a few of the severed fingers to show Stoner what would become of him if he talked. Gibbs told him that they would make up a scenario where Private First Class Justin Stoner goes on a mission where he doesn't return to the base because the enemy insurgents killed him. Stoner recognized those severed fingers and had seen them back in January. The threats officially terrified him, but Justin did not report the beating. Only after an NCO discovered his injuries, Justin was pressured into providing an explanation. The Army's Criminal Investigation Command initially interviewed Stoner, and based on what they learned, opened a full investigation. They brought Gibbs, Morlock, Winfield, Kinto, and Stoner to the Kandahar Airfield for interviews. Morlock was the most forthright and allowed investigators to videotape him. He went into detail about all the murders with the drop weapons and explosives. Everyone who was interviewed confirmed Stoner's claims. The hunt was on, and they searched every inch of FOB ramrod for explosives. They found the 81mm mortar and the RPG. Two fingers were found near Gibbs' housing, and a claimer mine was discovered in Gibbs' striker. Besides probing everyone in FOB Ramrod, the investigation branched out beyond the base with more interviews, photos, videos, and evidence collection. Some additional details surfaced during the investigation. It was reported that, in November 2009, an insurgent had been killed in an incident that involved an Apache helicopter. Gibbs talked a soldier into cutting off a finger from the dead man, and he kept it as a trophy. In March 2010, Gibbs and Stevens went to an Afghan National Army unit and offered them pornographic magazines for weapons. He thought it would be nice to have a little insurance in case he accidentally shot someone. In April, it was reported that Gibbs dug up some leg bones from a gravesite, but this was never solidly confirmed. After the investigation was concluded, they granted immunity to the soldiers who testified at Calvin Gibbs' trial. Wagnon and Bram were the only two soldiers in the group who didn't testify at Gibbs' trial, and they had their day in court after Calvin Gibbs. Specialist Adam Kelly from Montesano, Washington, was convicted of conspiring to harm whistleblower Justin Stoner. He was sentenced to 60 days hard labor and was discharged by the Army. Private First Class Ashton Moore from Severna Park, Maryland, was charged with smoke and hash, assault, and aggravated assault with a dangerous weapon. He received a cut in pay and rank after pleading guilty to smoking hash. Specialist Corey Moore from Redondo Beach, California, pleaded guilty to kicking a witness and stabbing a corpse. He received 60 days hard labor and a bad conduct discharge from the Army. Specialist Emmett Kintel was convicted of smoking hash, assault, and taking photos of Afghan casualties. He received 90 days hard labor and received a bad conduct discharge from the Army. Specialist Michael Wagner II was charged with one count of premeditated murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to commit assault. He also had a charge for possessing a skull fragment taken from a human corpse. All charges were dropped, and he went back to work for the Army. Staff Sergeant Robert Stevens was a medic from Portland, Oregon. He was convicted on four counts of firing at Afghans and was sentenced to nine months in prison. Stevens was allowed to remain in the Army, but was demoted to the lowest rank of E-1 Private. Private First Class Justin Stoner was never charged with a crime and was honorably discharged from the Army in 2012. Specialist Adam Winfield 
was the soldier who told his father the truth about the platoon's activities. He took a plea deal and was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and illegal drug use. He received three years in prison. Private First Class Andrew Holmes was from Idaho and was 19 at the time of the first murder. He claimed that Morlock threatened him after the murder of Galmudin. Holmes was convicted on multiple charges, including murder without premeditation and illegal drug use. He received seven years in prison. Sergeant Darren Jones, from Pomona, California, was convicted of participating in an assault of a fellow soldier. He received seven months in prison and was demoted to the rank of private. Staff Sergeant David Bram, from Vacaville, California, was convicted on multiple counts, including conspiracy to commit assault, obstruction of justice, solicitation to commit premeditated murder, and dereliction of duty. He received five years in prison and was eligible for parole in three years and four months. Corporal Jeremy Morlock from Wasilla, Alaska, was 21 at the time of the murders. They convicted him on three counts of premeditated murder, conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and illegal drug use. Since he cooperated with the government and testified against Gibbs and a few of the other men, his sentence was reduced to 24 years in prison, and he was allowed parole after eight years. Morlock was dishonorably discharged from the Army. Staff Sergeant Calvin Gibbs pointed the finger at Morlock and said he was the brains behind all the plans. Gibbs contended that Morlock and Winfield cherry-picked the evidence that only implicated him, and he implied that their judgment was not worthy of trust because they were on drugs for most of the deployment. Gibbs tried to explain why he had off-the-books explosives and weapons in his possession and claimed they were used in wells or used with hard-to-reach enemy weapons caches. This was easily discredited by platoon members who verified that all weapons needed to be accounted for in the system and there would never have been a rational reason to possess those unaccounted items. Gibbs admitted to showing Private First Class Justin Stoner the Afghan finger trophies to scare him into silence. Prior to Gibbs' arrival at FOB Ramrod, the platoon had only one engagement that resulted in the death of a Taliban insurgent, and after his arrival, the men from Bravo Company had several engagements in a few months' time. Gibbs had a tattoo on his left shin, that had a pair of crossed rifles, along with three red skulls and three blue skulls. The red ones were for his kills in Iraq and the blue for Afghanistan. During the investigation process, they revealed that Gibbs told a few soldiers he had killed an unarmed family in Iraq with two adults and one child. They deemed this a legal kill, but it needed to be opened and reinvestigated. Gibbs was asked at trial, how he can inflict violence on innocent people. He responded that what he did was no different than taking the antlers off of a deer. It wasn't surprising that the army found Calvin Gibbs to be the ringleader of all the staged murders. He was convicted of conspiracy to commit premeditated murder, battery, aggravated assault with a dangerous weapon, premeditated murder, assault consummated by battery, wrongful possession of bones and a tooth taken from one of the Afghan corpses, wrongful solicitation of another to cut the finger off of a corpse, two specifications of obstruction of justice, two specifications of dereliction of duty, and failure to obey a lawful general order. They sentenced him to life in prison with eligibility for parole. Gibbs also received a dishonorable discharge from the army. Brigadier General Stephen M. Twitty led a major investigation into officer accountability within the 5th Brigade Combat Team. He thought that the platoon had lower standards than other platoons. He concluded that there was no evidence that the higher-level commanders could have prevented the crimes, since nothing was reported beyond the platoon level. The report recommended some letters of reprimand and memos to file for some officers and NCOs. To the average observer, it seemed like there was a culture that didn't emphasize accountability. There was a lot of misconduct and lax supervision. 
More than a dozen soldiers smoked hashish, but drug testing was never performed. At least one soldier shot at dogs and chickens while on patrol. Thirty soldiers fell asleep in strikers outside the base and were caught by an officer who discovered them via drone. One soldier destroyed a housing unit when he accidentally shot a grenade from a launcher. That soldier's name was Private First Class Andrew Holmes. The leadership had not done all the proper checks to ensure the weapons had been checked back in. Some pictures that were taken with the U.S. Army platoon and the dead Afghans made it into the public, so the Army issued an apology. In June 2011, the FOB Ramrod base was renamed Sakari Kares, and a different battalion from Fort Riley, Kansas, was placed in charge of the base. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and music scoring were performed by me. I want to thank the following new patrons, Matthew T. and Keith C. Thank you, Keith, for the generous donation and the kind words on Twitter. Matthew, you didn't have an address listed, so if you'd like to claim your sticker, please message me on the Patreon platform. Thank you so much, everyone.